Hello again, everyone. Wow, this day has really been flying by. I hope that you enjoyed your final breakout session of the day. Um, I wanna quickly thank all of our presenters as well as our career and recruiting coaches who've been meeting with participants all day long. Um, we will be transitioning into our afternoon keynote speaker at 3.15, but before we do that, we have a really fun final activity break ready for you. Nicole Castillo will be leading us in a Polynesian Tahitian style dance. Nicole joined the Be Well at Work team as a wellness program coordinator. Nicole is an active member of a Polynesian dance troupe, okay, um, where she dances the hula and Tahitian competitively. We hope that you can take a moment to take care of yourself before attending our amazing keynote this afternoon. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Nicole. Take it away, Nicole. Aloha and yorana, everybody. Thanks, Maddie, for the wonderful introduction. Um, today, we've had an amazing opportunity to listen to some great speakers, presentations, and fantastic activity leaders before me. But right now, we're going to take a little break to move um, and do it a little bit differently than you might be used to. So if you haven't already, can everyone just get up out of your seats, stand up, find some room to move. And like Maddie said, we will be doing a little bit of dancing today, but Tahitian style. So when you think of Tahitian, you might think, whoa, Nicole, we're not putting on grass skirts and coconut brows today, are we? No, not today. Today, we're going to focus on a dance style called the Aparima, which translates to movement of the hands. So we're going to focus on flow, grace, breath, and mindfulness of our upper body movements, connecting to the whole theme of today. So, like I said, shake out your arms, find some room to move, and we're going to start with some basic hand movements. Um, I might turn to the side to make it easier. You're going to go ahead and put your right arm out in front of you, and we're going to focus on the wrist, moving the wrist up or down, and up, down, and up. Aside from movement of the wrist, we also have movement of the fingers. So take your fingers, close and open, close and open. Connecting those movements, we're going to take the wrist down, curl the fingers up, wrist up, straighten the fingers. Repeat, wrist down, curl fingers, wrist up, and straighten. Wrist down, curl fingers, wrist up, and straighten one more time. Down, curl, up, and straighten. Good. Now we're going to do that with both hands. So. Put them straight out in front of you, but for the purposes of our 2D zoom, we're going to go sideways. Down, curl, up, straighten. Down, curl, up, straighten. And now that we have those basic steps done, we are going to connect the dots and you want to make it flow gracefully. And that is our basic hand movements. You can do it forward, sideways down at your chest, or up high. Looking good, everybody. Now to the fun stuff. We're gonna actually learn a quick Tahitian routine today. Don't worry, super easy, it's beginner. You can do it. So, this song is called Taiti Nui. It is a song about being homesick. The author is homesick of her native island of Tahiti, and she's talking about longing for the beauty of the land and wanting to go back. So I'm gonna be mirroring you, so just copy me. I'm gonna be saying the correct arm, but doing them opposite. So you're gonna start with your left hand up, like so. Right hand is gonna go face down, and you're gonna scoop up with those graceful hands of practice and bring it out this way. Good, from there, you're gonna switch and take your left hand face down, scoop out with a little lean forward. Good. So starting from the top, right hand up like this, left, or sorry, left hand, right, left hand up, right hand down, palm down, scoop, open, switch, and hand out for the island. Good. Next, you're gonna take your hands facing your left, you're going to go from your forehead to the sky, turn, forehead to the sky. Good job. From there, you're going to scoop it forward. 
Looking good. Then you're going to pivot. You're going to cross your arms in, pivot, and pivot. Then you're going to give me four shoulder rolls. Roll right, roll left, roll right, roll left. Looking good. Then from there, with your arms crossed, you're going to take it up to the sky. And then a big scoop. And back out. Nice. All right, from here, we're going to talk about the waves, the ocean that leads us to the island of Tahiti. You're going to do the same movement with the hands that we practice. Keep them graceful, keep them flowing. We're going to go wave to our right, wave to our left, wave to our right, wave to our left. Got it? And then from there, we're going to um, symbolize more waves, rolling the waves, and for this one, if you can, for the sake of dance, we're going to take it down to the floor. Okay. Don't worry, you won't need to memorize this. You'll copy me when the music goes. Then from the floor, you're going to take your right hand, bring it up. Left hand, bring it up. Give yourself, clasp them together. This is symbolizing prayer. You're going to bring it down, back up, down, and slowly stand up. Nice. From here, you're going to take those hands, slowly bring them across your face, symbolizing the soundness of missing our Tahiti. And then wiggle your fingers, symbolizing tears, down to your sides. From there, you're going to take your right hand, Face down on your left shoulder, scoop up and out. Repeating the tears again. Cross your arms or your hands, wiggle your fingers. Tears come down the face, down to your sides. Left hand palm down, scoop it out to the side. Believe it or not, we've just learned a whole routine. So now we're going to try it with some music. You can follow along. I know that was a lot to memorize, but follow along. And let's try it out with some music. Tahiti Nui te fare aori tawahere ai Anna na hi ferururi aoe ahate uru Tahiti nui te fare aori tawahere ai Anna na hi ferururi aoe ahate uru Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you were able to feel 
a little bit of the island spirit and get that body moving. Um, now it's time to turn it back over to Maddie before your final speaker of the day. Back to you, Maddie. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nicole. That was an amazing activity. I loved it. I loved the music. I loved all of the movements. Uh, great job. So I would like to now bring back my co-chair of the NOW conference, Angela Stopper, to move us into our afternoon keynote. Um, I just want to quickly say that because of Angela's leadership and steadfast commitment to you and your, to all of you and your growth on campus, that is why we've been able to host this event and this amazing day of learning. So I just want to thank you, Angela, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Maddie. That's so kind. This has been just a wonderful day and it is not over yet. I have the great pleasure of welcoming everyone to our keynote, our final keynote of the day with Sahar Youssef. I hope that you've had a great day so far. I'm so excited to, to introduce the final speaker of the 2020 Next Opportunity at Work Conference. I have to say I am a big fan of Sahar's work and I know you are gonna have a great session. Dr. Sahar Youssef is a cognitive neuroscientist and the youngest business faculty at UC Berkeley. Her 10 plus years of research on making superhumans has been featured in Forbes and Business Insider. And it sheds light on how to improve focus, memory, and overall human performance in as little as seven weeks. Outside of the academic world, Sahar is the founder and managing director of Stoa Partners, a productivity training consulting firm, which helps executives and their teams carve out hours of the day to day uninterrupted for focused time so they can get more done in less time and with less mental energy. So with that, Sahar, thank you so much for being here. We're so excited to hear what you have to say and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here and excited to, to be with everyone really uh, in our entire Cal community in spirit, uh, in our own homes, but in spirit together. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, get started. All righty. So what to expect uh, for this afternoon? I would love to have an opportunity to review with you all the six, I would say, biggest and most fatal mistakes that all human beings across the board make when they're newly working from home. And I would love to be able to bring to my own community, our community, the science and the neuroscience and the physiology research behind each one of these mistakes. I don't want to talk about just what to do or what not to do, but really getting into the nitty gritty, talking about some research and data behind why we all are driven to make these common mistakes and what we can do instead. So every single mistake that I go over, each six will have the same structure. I'll first talk about uh, the mistake first, we'll name it, and then we'll talk about the biological principle behind that mistake. We'll dive into a little bit of the research and we'll end with the takeaways and we'll move through each one of the six relatively quickly. Uh, it took a whole lot, I think, out of me uh, emotionally to distill all of this down. I wanted to keep everything. So it was quite an internal negotiation. So my, my uh, way of dealing with this is I'm gonna talk a whole lot faster. Um, um, via Zoom than I would otherwise if we had the luxury of being in person and I had multiple hours, but we're going to go through this pretty quickly. So strap in. I know it's the afternoon, but we had an amazing uh, uh, break and, and dance routine. So hopefully everyone is energized. Alrighty, I'll go ahead and get started. So mistake number one is actually muddled association. So what do we mean by that? The brain mistake behind muddled associations is actually that our behavior as human beings is predominantly driven by what are called neural networks. And neural networks are patterns of electrical activation in the human brain. The human brain is actually really just one large electrical system. And in response to certain stimuli, that stimulus might be uh, another human being, it could be a sound, it could be um, a visual stimulus of some sort, a coffee mug, uh, anything. In response to a certain stimulus, you're going to get electrical activation in the brain, neural activation in the brain. And certain neural networks will either be activated or deactivated. And that activation, that electrical activation, will either make certain types of behavior more or less likely. Your brain is constantly going through this loop looking for what is expected and unexpected behavior at any given moment. What is appropriate and even inappropriate behavior given any single moment, given the stimulus around you, your environmental stimuli. I'll go over, I would say a very, uh, uh, Em, like emotional, emotionally memorable experience I think that we've all had before and that's a library. The library here is the stimulus. So you have uh, years and years of memories potentially of what a library is associated with. 
what's appropriate and what is inappropriate behavior in a library. I'm sure most of us have at least had one experience where we've walked into a library not really feeling very studious, very, very focused very productive, but because we have that benefit of all of those memories, those decades worth of associations to really rely on, those neural networks are, are working in our favor here. So those neural networks associated with being quiet, focused, productive, etc., become electrically activated in response to being in that environmental stimulus. But for example, if I asked you to get your most important productive work done throughout the course of the day in a nightclub, let's say for example, we don't have the luxury of having a lot of experiences or memories of doing focused productive work in a nightclub. So it's not really serving us in that, in that particular domain. Now let's talk about what we're dealing with right now, all of us. We are all sheltering in place, stuck in our homes. And our homes, for most of us, unless we have years of, of experience and a history of working remote, working from our homes, our homes are associated with time spent with loved ones, with rest, sleep, relaxation, binge watching Netflix on the couch. That's what our homes are associated with. It's not gonna be getting into a 100% on focused productive brain state. So if you've recently found yourself, uh, I would say maybe never getting 100% on and never being 100% off as well, you're not alone. It's also not your fault. It's, our brains are literally electrically confused. Every single morning you wake up in your bedroom and you look around in your environment and you see all of the stimuli, all of the things, the objects, the people, the sights and the sounds associated with home, with rest and play. And you're trying to get your brain state into the same type of brain state it used to have going onto campus, for example. It's not going to be the same. You're not alone. We're all dealing with the same struggle here. So what can we really start doing to design these cognitive associations? Because truly, you are either going to be the victim of these cognitive associations, cognitive associations because it's truly just how the brain works and operates, or we can start to become the architect of these associations. Ideally, you're going to have some sort of dedicated workspace in a separate or private area. So this is your, the idea here is to carve out a blank slate for your brain, even if it's the corner of a room. I'm not saying everyone needs to go and like find some sort of private office, but think about what you can do creatively in your own home to take a corner that you're typically working in and make it your own. Even go, going so far as to set up a table that you can disassemble at the end of the day so that you can keep those associations clean and clear and those boundaries clean and clear as if to say to your brain, this isn't the bedroom, this isn't the dining room, this isn't the living room, this is the office in this corner. And the only thing that happens, the only appropriate behavior that happens here is the focus and productive work, but also all of my stress related to work lives in this location and I'm not letting it bleed over into the rest of my life. Now, if you're short on space like I am, uh, what you can do, I actually had an old student send in this photo. Um, she actually went ahead and gutted a hallway closet, thinking to herself, it's fine. It's a global pandemic. I don't need an entire hallway closet for linens uh, and towels. I'm going to put that in the garage and then created, you know, a little private workstation for herself. And she, there's, it's not even enough space to close the door behind her, but it's an area that isn't associated with anything. It's not the library. It's not the nightclub. It's nothing. It's a closet. We don't have a whole lot of memories in the closet. Think about the garage. What can you do? Get creative here. But again, if you're short on space, that is absolutely fine. I myself I usually actually work on my dining room table. Uh, and what you can do if you're short on space is introduce some sort of physical or sensory trigger to automatically get yourself into that certain headspace. The idea is to introduce some sort of trigger, some sort of physical stimuli that is new, unique, maybe even a little odd to your typical work setup or workstation. Let's say if you're working at the kitchen table or the dining room table so that your brain says to itself, huh, this is not the typical table. This is not the dining room table. This is not the kitchen table. Something odd is happening. Maybe you're covering it with a tablecloth during work hours and then taking that tablecloth away. You don't have a tablecloth, you can go to the, you know, your closet and grab an old t-shirt. Uh, the idea here is to introduce something new and unusual so that your brain has an opportunity to lay down the foundation for new associations so that you can design those associations from scratch. Using a candle, I think, is also a phenomenal strategy here because it's multi-sensory. The more associations and, as I would say, sensory associations you have, the better. You get more bang for your buck here. But having a candle is phenomenal, a focused candle, so to speak, because it also is the added benefit of having not only a sight, you can see the candle right next to your computer, but also a smell associated with it, potentially. 
but also the added ritual of lighting the candle when you want to sit down and do really serious, productive, focused work. You just need to be very careful when you're introducing some sort of physical stimuli into your, into your new environment that you have to make sure that these boundaries are clean and clear, which means at the end of the workday, you put the table away, you put the tablecloth or the old t-shirt away, you blow out the candle and you put it away out of sight and out of mind so that you make sure that those associations are clean and clear. A thing that I'm doing personally is I actually have a lemon. I actually go, I have a, a lemon tree in my backyard. I go grab a lemon either from the, from the kitchen bowl somewhere. I give it a sniff. I give it a squeeze and I put it down next to my laptop. So now the smell and the sight of having a lemon at my dining room table is associated with focused work mode. And then when I put that lemon away at the end of the day, I've like pretty much ruined lemons for myself, by the way, if anyone wants to know, lemonade is no longer enjoyable. <laughs> when I'm done with my day, I put that lemon away and then I get my dining room table back, which is just associated with shared meals with the loved ones. Again, think about what you can do here. Have a work mug and then make sure you never use your mug after hours. You know, you can transition to whatever your, your poison, a wine glass or an evening mug for your herbal tea, whatever it may be. What's nice here, which is why I have the Spotify logo here, is music because music is portable. When we do hopefully at some point get back into the office, maybe on campus, maybe we don't. But the point is, if you have a certain type of music associated with getting into that focus headspace, you can port that over into any home, any location, anywhere and have a, having a ramp down playlist. So that's where I want to go next is we're talking about how to get into that 100% focused on state. But let's talk about ramping down from the day. You need to transition to things that are only associated with evening time, with weekend time, with rest and relaxation again. You have to win back and protect that space for yourself. So again, even if you're in comfortable clothes, I mean, we all are, you know, wearing probably more comfortable clothing, especially now when we're all working from home, but have a set of clothes that's just going to be comfortable home clothes and then a comfortable really at home after work hour clothes or have this type of music that you listen to to ramp down your mind from the end of the day. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, this is a cherry on top, Sahar. I mean, that sounds really great, but there's a reason why I actually put this as mistake number one. And that is if on the left, you're recently finding it very difficult to get into 100% on mode, you're, you're trying to get into a focused, productive headspace and crank through your work, but you're thinking about your Amazon shopping cart and a bunch of other things that you need to do related to your home and to your family. Or for example, when you're trying to actually relax at the end of the day and fall asleep and you notice that your mind is kind of racing with, with work-related thoughts and stresses, you're not alone, but it's going to get worse. And you can help yourself by really, really sticking to these boundaries, really fighting back against these muddled associations while your brain and those neural networks are still malleable. So think about what you might be able to do here. I'm going to jump into mistake number two, and that is poor hygiene. And I assure you, I'm not going to launch into a tutorial on how to wash your hands properly during the pandemic. When I'm talking about hygiene, I'm actually talking about environmental and digital hygiene. Now, the reason why environmental and digital hygiene is so important is that the human brain is really hardwired to constantly scan the environment for any type of potential threat. And the reason why is because human beings are not that are not that competitive in the animal kingdom. We're relatively hairless and plushy, soft creatures. Our nails and our teeth are not that sharp. If a lion, tiger, or a bear were to walk in right now, I would not be able to fight it off. The idea here is because we're not competitive, we're hardwired to constantly be scanning so that if a threat were to come in, we can hear it in advance so that we can either run away, we can hide, or at least alert the rest of our pack, the rest of our community, our tribe, so that they can run and hide themselves and protect themselves. Now let's talk about the real estate in the human brain briefly for a second. You have the occipital cortex in the very back of the head right over here, and you have the temporal cortex here. Both of these brain areas combined make up upwards of 40% of the real estate in the human brain. That's almost half of the human brain dedicated to what? just visual and auditory processing. That means up to half of your brain is constantly scanning and constantly processing everything that you're seeing around you and everything that you're hearing. Now, I want to go over a couple of different studies. In 2018, Harvard actually came out with the first ever empirical study on open offices. Okay, In this particular study, they followed a few Fortune 500 companies going from completely closed uh, cubicles, old school style, to completely open open floor plans. And they noticed a couple of different things. But two things I wanted to mention is one, they noticed marked decreases in productivity. And the second is significant increases in cortisol, a stress hormone in the body. Now, why would they see this? They looked to biologists for the answer. And of course, it's not going to be surprising to a biologist. You take a human being, again, we're not competitive in the animal kingdom. Every single time Bob gets up to go to the bathroom or Kelly gets up to go grab a cup of coffee, you're not, you can't help but process it. You're going to be paying attention. So every single time that happens, 
it's going to be draining your cognitive resources. Every conversation that you can hear in the background in an open office floor plan, it's going to be draining those cognitive resources through the back of your mind. So you'll have less attention and ability to, to deploy to the task at hand, whatever that task may be. And every single time you hear or see something, your brain is thinking to itself, it's a possible threat. So you're going to get that spike in cortisol all throughout the day, which in the, in the short term is associated with stress, absolutely. But in the long term is also associated with burnout. So why am I bringing up? up the study. We're not in an open office. We're in no office. We're in our homes. We were in something actually ostensibly worse from a biological perspective. We're in our, the open home office because everyone in your home, everyone that you see or hear around you in your home, you're going to care more about. They're even more emotionally triggering to all of us than folks in, in, our, in a typical office layout with these Fortune 500 companies in this particular example. Okay, so the idea here is what can we start doing to really protect our visual and auditory environment because it is background draining all of the time. <coughs> excuse me. I wanted to also talk about this particular set of studies, <coughs> excuse me, on auditory distractions. Now, in this particular set of studies, they were able to see that background noise, but especially intelligible speech. Now, this is speech that you can actually understand. So if you can hear a conversation and understand what's being said, or if the TV is on, or a podcast is playing, or even if you're listening to music in a language that you understand, it can create upwards of a 10% performance decrement. It's huge. That means we're up to 10% dumber if we can hear or see or, or hear, hear conversations in the background. This is huge. I, I like to, to liken this to actually a physical analogy. It's like running the same amount of distance. You can run, let's say a mile from point A to point B, but it's like strapping a weight vest onto yourself. You're just gonna go about it much slower and it's gonna take more energy for you to drown out all of that background noise and try to focus on uh, the thing in front of you. So let's launch into the takeaways here. We're gonna start with visual and then move into auditory. Starting with visual, think about what you might be able to do to create some sort of barrier or a wall to protect yourself again from all of the visual distractions around you. I wanted to share with you all this somewhat comical image uh, that was sent in uh, to me by a senior vice president over at the, the Tokyo offices of Google after giving a very similar talk. Uh, this is pre-COVID. And after I gave this uh, address, uh, he emailed me and said, uh, thank you for that. But now I finally understand why it's been so difficult for me over the years to get my focus and productive work done in the office. I end up honestly taking it home with me and doing it evenings and weekends. And now I know why, because everyone is constantly walking by and I can see folks walking by all the time, even when I have my headphones in. So we actually went uh, online onto Amazon after this talk and bought $80 bed sheets and made this really, um, I would say somewhat comical fort uh, inside of the office. I'm not suggesting you make a fort in your home unless you really want to, of course. But the idea here is what can you do to create some sort of visual separation between everything else going on in your home, especially if you're in a high traffic area uh, and, and creating that kind of distance for yourself so that you're not background draining those cognitive resources. So think about what you do. Turning towards a wall or a window, for example, is a phenomenal strategy. That's what I do. And I would say an often underutilized technique from neuroscience is actually to close your eyes. If you close your eyes for a minimum of, of 10 seconds, we see a massive spike in alpha waves in the brain. That's an indication of restfulness in the brain. What you're doing is you're taking the largest area of the human brain. And again, that's the occipital cortex in the very back of the head. That area is dedicated to visual processing and you're giving that a rest. It's like creating a dam for the energy resources inside of the human brain. Just 10 seconds of closing your eyes. Honestly, take this 10, take the next 10 seconds right now to close your eyes. You don't need to see the screen or me or the slides. Just take 10 seconds and close your eyes and notice what effect it has on your mind, on your body. Think about what you can do in between calls and meetings. You're waiting for your cup of coffee to get made in the morning. Take an opportunity, 10 seconds and just close your eyes. Every time you take a bathroom break, 10 seconds and just close your eyes. It makes a massive difference by the end of the day, just managing and maintaining the energy that we do have. Another really, I would say, uh, COVID-related uh, strategy and advice that I'd love to share is to hide self-view from your visual environment. Why is this so important? There is nothing more biologically unnatural than being in a meeting or in an important conversation with another person. And instead of looking at them, what do we end up doing? We look at ourselves because we can see our own reflection. And we're thinking to ourselves, oh my goodness, my hair. And oh my goodness, how does the background look? What's the lighting like? What do I look like? 
It's normal. It's natural. It's biological. These are biological fundamental tendencies. You can't fight it. We all do it. So do yourself a favor and go into hit this a little ellipses over here and hide self view next time you're in a zoom call and do it every single time. Make it your default setting because it's as if think about going on a date. Think about going into an important meeting and instead of really focusing in on the other person or the other people in the room, you have a massive mirror that you drag into the room with you and you just keep staring at yourself oscillating back and forth. It's completely biologically unnatural what we've done with video conferencing. So do yourself a favor, hide self view. And now let's moving in, move into auditory. Noise canceling headphones are gonna be the holy grail, but they're not necessary whatsoever. I use normal everyday headphones myself. But the point here is to think about what you can do to protect that auditory system from all of the background noise in all of our homes. All the other people, the conversations, everything going on, even outside noise, anything that's not goal relevant, think about what you can do to protect that system and protect this brain from background processing it. And headphones are phenomenal. If you really don't like headphones, you can even use earplugs. Um, and listening to music can be really helpful, especially in a noisy household, because you can start to drown out um, that extra background noise, especially if it's really quite loud uh, and intrusive, because having just headphones or earplugs in won't be enough. Now, remember, going back to that set of studies I mentioned, if you can understand the lyrics you're going to background process them. So that means, unfortunately, no Taylor Swift or anything else uh, that you understand. Listen to music that in a, in a language that you don't understand, okay? So you can get multinational with it. I personally listen to pretty obnoxious um, Swedish and German techno music when I'm working. I don't speak those languages. I had that's the added benefit. Um, but you can even listen to white noise, um, anything you like, but something that can drown out the noise in a language that you don't understand. Okay. So now drum roll, please, for the biggest drain of our cognitive resources throughout the course of the day, and that is the smartphone. The normal, average, everyday smartphone. If you have one, it's draining your cognitive resources. I wanted to share this particular study that came out of UT Austin a couple of years ago. In this study, they took a large sample of healthy, high-performing adults, and they had them take a battery of cognitive assessments. These are tests of attention. These are tests of different types of memory long-term, short-term, complex, short-term memory. They also had them take um, assessments of general fluid intelligence. Now they had them do this one time in a normal lab setting, which you know is a glorified closet. It's kind of like going to the doctor's office to get uh, some sort of test done. So you leave all of your belongings in the waiting room or in the lobby, and they're, you're taken into this glorified closet painted all black. There are no windows, nothing to distract you at all. And you're going to take these cognitive um, assessments that are usually digitized on a computer inside of the room all by yourself. So nothing to distract you. They had them do this one time, just as I described, but they had them do this one other time, but this time they had them do this. But before they went in, they asked the individuals, do you have a cell phone? Most of them of course said, yes. They asked them to power down their cell phones completely before going in. And they said, we want you to pout, shut down your cell phone completely and just put it face down on the table so it doesn't distract you. So nothing comes in. Everyone says, okay, that sounds fine. So they put it next to them. Now remember, this is just off to the side. Like I'm gonna grab my notepad here. It's like a prop, it's dead. There are no notifications, there are no calls, there are no lights, there's nothing happening, no vibrations, nothing. It is off. Cell phone off to the side of the computer. Across the board, every single assessment they had these folks do, when, they were, when the cell phone was in the room with them, their scores were significantly lower, significantly. So everyone was measurably dumber when the cell phone was present in the room. Mind you, again, the most important, I would say, factor in this study is that the cell phone is off. It is not interrupting anybody. It's not a technical distraction. But when your cell phone is in your visual field, you cannot help because again, going back to associations, the memories that we hold on those phones. Anytime you get bad news, where does it come from? Where's your first line of defense? Good news, the news in general, what's going on in the world? We'd like to stay connected. If your family member needs to call you, where, where, where is it first gonna come in? It's not gonna be the home phone. It's not gonna be email. It's gonna be the phone, your cell phone. Think about what you can do to create some separation here. If your phone is out in front of you right now, you are not at 100%. That is something that I would love for everyone to embrace here. When you want to be 100% present, if that's for your work, great. If that is for your family, for your life, great. Whenever you want to be at 100%, make sure there is some separation between you and that cell phone because it's background draining those cognitive resources, if you can see it. 
What I would recommend is actually to get some sort of cell phone basket for your household, especially if you have other folks that you live with. You can get a, a household culture of everyone putting their phone in the basket when you want to sit down to a meal and be 100% present or a conversation and be 100% present. If it's time to get focused work done for an hour, it's a great opportunity to put the cell phone in the basket, put it in an area, um, maybe in the living room that's, that's communal that can act as a trigger. So if the cell phone basket is empty, it will remind you that, hey, where's your cell phone? Are you carrying it around your own home? You know, from room to room, you don't really need to do that anymore. You can put it in the cell phone basket and create some sort of separation. If you don't have a basket, you can go to the kitchen and grab a bowl. The idea is, again, to not have it in sight in your visual field when you're sitting down to do your work or when you're sitting down to actually be at 100% intentionally with a loved one. Now, some, I would say, advanced topics and techniques related to the smartphone. But before I launch into these, I do need to admit something, is that the reason why the cell phone is so darn addictive is because of evil versions of people like me. Uh, these are behavioral neuroscientists that were hired and poached by these tech companies hand or foot, hand or foot back in the day. Actually, many of them were from Berkeley, um, hired from addiction labs uh, in the Bay Area and really hired to figure out how to make the cell phone and applications as addictive as possible. How do we make them as sticky as possible? How do we get folks to just be compelled to keep checking, taking out their phone, any, any blank moment in their life, any in-between time, that phone's gonna come right back out. And I assure you, evil versions of people like myself have gamed everything about how the cell phone works to steal your attention away and to keep you coming back for more. So two pieces of advice I would really love for everyone to really take home with them. The first is, to reevaluate your relationship with your notifications. Don't think about what notifications you can turn off. Instead, flip it. Turn them all off and ask yourself, what notifications do I have to have on? What will I allow to interrupt my precious mind flow, my conscious experience? Because truly where your attention is, is your consciousness and that it becomes your life. What will you allow to come in through the defenses and actually interrupt your train of thought? A moment with a loved one a quiet moment with yourself. What notifications are so such an emergency that you will allow in? And of course, you can put in a VIP notifications with your phone. You can make sure that if the hospital calls, if the police department calls, if a loved one calls, it'll get through, but otherwise you have a line of defense. And the other piece here is around how addictive our phones actually look and feel to us. Again, everything about the phone has been gamed to steal your attention away. So if you've never tried this before, give it a shot today and go into settings and put your phone into grayscale. Everything again about what these icons look like has been gained to steal your attention away. So if you've never tried this before, again, give it a shot, go into grayscale mode, make sure that there are no colors anymore and you'll notice immediately that your phone is less stimulating and you're less compelled to spend time on it. Give it a try and let me know if it doesn't work and I'll give you guys more advice. Mistake number three is actually being a passenger and this is a little bit nuanced here, so I'm gonna stop here. Being a passenger to your day versus being the driver to your day. What does being a passenger look like? It looks like checking email first thing in the morning and you see a bunch of things that have come in, requests, et cetera. And you see all of these things coming in. And instead of you figuring out what your priorities are, you launch in to a reactive mode of answering a bunch of emails and messages as opposed to figuring out what the most important things are. Now, the reason why we're naturally wired to be passengers as opposed to drivers is that the human brain is actually wired to seek reward and avoid pain. This whole concept of delayed gratification is a modern concept. Human beings did not know when our next meal was going to come in, if we were going to have a mate, if we we're going to be safe, if we we're even going to live next week. We are not wired to uh, delay gratification. We needed resources, et cetera, today, right now. So we're always looking for dopamine the reward chemical inside of the human brain. This is really the fundamental driver of our days and how we're feeling on a daily basis. Dopamine is what drives all of us. And I wanna introduce you all to a concept of slow versus fast dopamine. Because again, going back to biology, we are all going to be this rat over here to the right, pressing the lever for food or pressing the lever for dopamine in this case, as quickly as possible. We want it yesterday and we want it for as little effort as humanly possible. So we all want fast dopamine. Now thinking about our to-do list, our priority list briefly, what on your to-do list is gonna give you a fast hit of dopamine for as little effort as possible? It's gonna give you a sense of progress and completion 
for most of us, it's going to be email. It's going to be sending and receiving messages. So we all end up living in the inbox as opposed to the slow dopamine tasks. These are going to be the tasks on your to-do list or your priority list that might take hours, days, weeks even to complete, to get to that big cheese at the end of the maze. But the idea here is that in order to game for those slow dopamine tasks, you need to really make them feel like fast dopamine tasks. We're not going to naturally gravitate to them, but that's what's going to be, uh, that's, that what is what will actually move your career forward. That's what's going to get you promoted. That's what's going to get you learning and doing more in the long run. So I want you all to start differentiating your to-do list on a daily basis into two categories, your MITs versus your LITs. Your MITs are your most important tasks. These are the, the one to a maximum of three things on your to-do list that if you were to do them would make today a success. That's what's going to actually launch your career forward. Those are your MITs. What, what are you going to remember a month from now having done today? What is your boss going to remember you having done today a month from now versus your LITs? Your LITs are those less important tasks or least important tasks. These are the things that got to get done. They will get done. They're the meetings, the emails, the little things in between here and there where other folks are maybe putting things on your plate. Those are fast dopamine tasks. And you want to make sure that you're not prioritizing those. And if you're wondering to yourself, I can't differentiate between the two. Everything seems important. You can ask yourself, what is your unique contribution? Focus on contribution. Prioritize those MITs. Again, no more than three a day. And the idea here is if you figure out what those MITs are, write them down on a piece of paper and it will act as an anchor to bring your attention back. Write them down and make sure that those things get done. And the moment those things get done, guess what? Today is a success and you can turn off for the rest of the day. Rest easy so that you can actually focus on resting and rejuvenating at the end of the day, as opposed to running on that hamster wheel, thinking to yourself, well, I can just send five more emails. I got to just get this, this, and this done, focusing on those LITs. If you notice that it's a little bit difficult to launch into those MITs, we all avoid them like the plague. You're not alone. Again, it's biology. Make those MITs, those slow dopamine tasks, look and feel as small as an email. So break down those large tasks into small manageable chunks. Something as small as a five minute task, a 10 minute task. So don't think about the mountain. Think about the little tiny steps that you can take along the way. And that's how you can get those really large complex tasks and projects to look as easy as email. And you're going to crank through them so much faster. Quick win here is to know and re ruthlessly deprioritize those LITs for sure. Mistake number four is actually constant expenditure, constantly being connected and constantly expending energy. The bio biological principle I'd like to introduce you all to is that the hours of the day are not equal. Our nine to five is not the same. Me at 9 a.m. is not the same as at 9 p.m. And the reason why is that human beings all have what are called biological chronotypes. There are three main chronotypes and a chronotype is a genetic optimum of your circadian rhythm. It is your energy profile throughout the course of the day. It dictates when you should go to sleep, when you should wake up and actually how energized and clear thinking you are throughout the day. When are you the most creative, et cetera. Now there are three main types. Types one and two, uh, types one and three are, are relatively straightforward. Type one is AM shifted. Those are the morning birds. They wake up bright eyed and bushy tailed and linearly decrease as the day progresses. And then you have PM shifted folks like myself, the genetic minority that wake up really exhausted and ramp up as the day progresses. And then you have the majority of the population, the biphasic folks. Now these individuals have two main energy humps throughout the day. One, um, I would say mid to late morning, and then they have an energy dip uh, in the middle of the day. And then they have a second wind as the day uh, goes forward. Now, if you're wondering what type you may be, there's a couple of different Berkeley sleep researchers that made um, a, a digitized assessment, especially due to COVID, uh, since we can't do genetic testing um, as easily anymore within the lab. It's mychronotype.com. And we asked them to give um, everyone at the NOW conference uh, a code so that it's discounted. So you can use Go Bears um, as, your, as, your, as your discount code to figure out what your chronotype is if you feel like you're not uh, intuitively aware of what that chronotype might be. Now, let's talk about strategically designing our day based on that chronotype. Once you've figured out what your chronotype is, the most impactful thing that you can do is to protect at least one hour in that window when you're at your peak performance. For me, that's actually going to be later in the day. It's going to be after 6 p.m. That's when I'm at my best. I make less mistakes and I move through my tasks way faster. For most other people, it's going to be mid-morning. You want to protect that time. So if you can help it, move meetings out of that space, even if it's one to two days a week where you say, listen, I just figured out what my chronotype is and I would really like to get this particular task done or schedule fake meetings for yourself. Say you need to do X, Y, and Z, but block off your calendar so that you can protect that time to do your most important work. The other piece that's really impactful here is to take periodic 
brain breaks to regain energy and motivation throughout the day, we have to take breaks. But what is a brain break? And how is it different from the, how the rest of us typically will take a break? A brain break is actually the ceasing of processing of information in the brain. No reading, no writing, no arithmetic. That means you're not processing any new information. So scrolling through, you know, uh, an Instagram feed, unfortunately, does not count as taking a break. So in between all the meetings, all the calls, all of the important work that you have to do, actually stopping for a second and not processing anything new. Go for a quick walk, even just move around, go grab a snack, rehydrate. Even a restroom break can be a great brain break, as long as you're not again, processing new information. Now, the quick win here is to figure out when you're at least at your worst. For me, that's first thing in the morning. For the most of you, I'm sure it's not going to be that. But maybe later in the afternoon, when you're in that afternoon dip, you might as well take that opportunity to know when that is, embrace it, identify it. It's biological. Don't fight it. And do your least important work during that time. Crank through those LITs during that time, for example. All right. Now, mistake number five is excessive task switching. By the way, multitasking is a myth. It's not real. We can't do it. And the, the biological principle be behind excessive task switching and the, the multitasking myth is that you do in fact pay a fine for every small task switch. Every single time we switch from task A to task B, we pay a fine for it. We pay for it in energy and we pay for it in time. This is a graphic showing you all what context switching or task switching looks like, which is the actual term in the literature. Because again, multitasking is not real. You cannot do two things at once. You can think of it as having 100% brain power. So if you want to do two things at once, you can't do 100% on task A and B at the same time. Mm -mm, not possible. You can do 50 and 50. You can do 80 and 20, but you're breaking up that 100 into some form or another. And it's up to you how you do that. Every single time you switch from your inbox to back uh, to a document, back to the inbox, back to a document or a spreadsheet, from a call back to another spreadsheet, every single time you switch, you do pay a fine, and that is called switch cost. You pay a fine, again, in, in energy drain and also time. It will take you longer to do the same tasks if you continue to try to task switch or multitask throughout the course of the day, as opposed to monotask, which is to sit down and figure out what you want to do, accomplish it, move on to the next task. Now, Going into the, the, the takeaways here to minimize switch costs, the most impactful thing is actually just to monotask instead of multitask. And there's a methodology of work that was actually developed at Berkeley um, uh, in our lab called Focus Sprints. And I'm going to talk about how to do that in just a second, but that's going to be the most impactful way that you can work and combat this energy drain throughout the course of the day. The quick win, there's a couple here that I'm going to run through very quickly. Maximize your screen or close out of email when you're working. Actually, just make sure that you don't have that temptation easily there right next to you. The next is interruptive ideas, as I call them. So this is you're sitting down to work. And of course, we're all going to have that, that immediate drain of, oh, I need to buy toilet paper from it. Okay. And then you write, write it down on a parking lot instead of switching and actually going to do um, that particular task in any given moment. Or, oh, I need to follow up with so-and-so write it down right next to you. Actually have a parking lot, a piece of paper next to you, next to your workstation, where you jot it down, you know that you won't forget it, it's written down, and then you can redirect your uh, attention back to the task at hand at, instead of jumping into a potential rabbit hole and going back into the inbox. The next is tab hoarding. If you're a tab hoarder like me and your browser looks like this and it's full of a bunch of articles and uh, different, different things that you're going to be looking at later that you hope to get to at some point, what you can do is actually use um, something called one tab or just have an active or a passive window for all of your tabs. So when you want to sit down to actually do something and you want to give it 100% of your attention, open up a new window and only open up the tabs that are relevant for the task at hand and then take that all of those other tabs, if you're a tab hoarder, and minimize it so it's out of sight and out of mind and not tempting you to look at things and not draining those background cognitive resources as you're trying to sit down and work. Now, I'm going to launch into focus sprints very quickly of how to do it, okay? Focus sprints uh, are, is a methodology of work. There's decades worth of research behind each one of these steps, and they sound dead simple, but give it a try, but you do have to make sure that you follow each one of these steps in order for it to be effective. The first is to set aside a block of time in advance in the calendar. This, if you have a shared calendar, also communicates to the people that you work with that you're not watching Netflix on the couch or taking a long nap in the middle of the day, that if you're not, resp not responsive, you're actually doing the most important things on your to-do list. You're doing focused, important work, and it's blocked off and respected. The second is to actually scope 
out what you aim to accomplish. This is important for two reasons. The first is it will act as an anchor if you actually write it down on a piece of paper on a post-it and put it right next to your computer, write down what you aim to accomplish. And when you start to get other thoughts, other things start to come to mind, you, you're tempted to go back into the inbox, it will act as an anchor and bring your attention back to focus and say, I said that I was gonna do this by the end of the hour. So I will have to redirect my attention and focus and do this. The other reason why this is so important actually goes back to dopamine. If you don't actually scope out what you aim to accomplish, you will be working your butt off every single day, every single hour. And, in, and then the only way that you're going to get dopamine is if you feel a sense of completion. And if all you've said to yourself is, I'm going to get lots of important work done today. I'm going to get lots of work done today. When is work done? I don't know about you, but my work is never done. It seems like an infinite treadmill. More work is coming down the pipeline as I'm doing work. Since work is never done, you're never going to get that hit of dopamine. So it will never feel good. You're just draining your energy and motivation throughout the course of the day. So do yourself a favor. And before you sit down to do anything, even if that's email, say, I'm going to do X. I'm going to do it. Scope it out before you launch into it and break it, break down those MITs into tiny little LITs. Third step, eliminate distraction. This goes back to hygiene. Make sure your phone is out of sight, out of mind. You're on do not disturb. You have no notifications coming in. Notifications are the bane of my existence. They're going to steal your attention away and absolutely slow you down and drain those cognitive resources. Make sure you're out of email, et cetera. You you're set yourself up for success uh, to actually do the focus sprint properly. And the next is to focus using an actual timer. Human beings and most mammals are actually vulnerable to a sense of progress. So think about actually using a real physical timer. Buy a physical timer or or um, have some sort of other uh, like auditory timer going off to make sure that you know when you're 15 minutes into a focus sprint, if it's an hour long, and every 15 minutes you get a little beep to keep you moving quickly throughout the task so you don't get lost down a rabbit hole. And the last step is to actually take a real brain break. Couple of minutes at the very end, get up, close your eyes, rehydrate, refuel, but do something that actually replenishes those glucocorticoids. These are stress hormones in the body that helped you focus in the first place so that you can actually do the next focus sprint properly and you're not gonna be nose diving at energy as the day progresses. Now, I know this sounds really simple, but truly we don't have enough time for me to go through a, a bunch of different case studies, but I didn't want to mention because we just wrapped this up last week um, from our lab at Cal is that within two weeks, we took a large group of engineers over at Google and we saw 26% average individual productivity increase within two weeks of doing focus sprints. And all we did was give every single engineer their chronotype, and taught them how to do focus sprints. And we saw such a huge uptick in productivity, which makes everybody happy, which also means it's not just for the sake of productivity, it's so that you don't have work at the end of the day. I want everyone to get their work done efficiently so they can move on to their real life, so that you can rest at the end of the day, guilt-free, and not feel like you need to constantly run on that hamster wheel. I want everyone to get their work done so they can rest and sleep and spend time with their loved ones. Mistake number six, always being connected. Now, focus sprints are going to fail if you don't pay attention to mistake number six, always being connected. This is connected through email, connected through our devices, text, phone, etc. Why are we always driven to being connected? Well, human beings are pack animals. We're one of the most social species on the face of the planet. We're afraid of letting down our pack. We don't want to be the person who isn't responsive. Somebody asks you for something and then five hours later, you respond to them. We don't want to let down our pack. People are asking the belief behind all of this right now due to COVID because we're remote is if people can't see me, how will they know I'm working? And conversely, if you're a manager or a supervisor, you're asking yourself, if I can't see my people, how will I know they're working? And because of this fear, because of this fear, we're compelled to be hyper responsive. And this is buffered by the literature as well and the research. We actually see when folks go remote, when teams go remote, they actually have hyper responsiveness. They're responding even faster than they would in the office to compensate for this. Do yourself a favor and try to embrace as much as possible asynchronous communication. This is what makes the most high performing and productive remote companies and remote teams is asynchronous communication. Let folks know that you're not gonna be responsive all the time via email. If it's an emergency, maybe they should send you a text message or they should indicate what is urgent in their email response so that you don't feel compelled to constantly monitor all the inboxes in case a fire comes in. Nobody should be firefighting on a daily basis across multiple inboxes. Otherwise you can't focus sprint and actually get your focus work done. So embrace asynchronous communication. So to combat this need to be constantly connected, the most impactful thing you to do is create that urgent line. 
most everyone I work with say, say I want to do focus sprints, but I feel like, you know, if I, if I completely close out of my inbox for two hours, for example, some emergency is going to come in and I'm going to miss it. Create an urgent line for your loved ones and enable VIP notifications. And the quick win here is to actually batch process your email and your chat. Think about it like laundry for a second. At the end of one day, you've worn one outfit. You don't immediately go to the laundry machine and put, put you know, waste all of that energy and those resources to do uh, laundry with just one outfit, you wait until the end of the week. You wait until you've accumulated a laundry basket full of items so that you can batch process it. Treat your inbox the same way because you will work through everything faster if you batch everything together. You can do this every, you know, start conservative, 30, 60 minutes, check into email intentionally, sign out of it, no notifications. Then go do a, go about your life, do your work. Then sign back in at the, at the end of the hour again. Do this in a batch process. You will notice a massive difference, not only for your mental health, but you'll do things faster, I promise you. MIT actually ran a study on the most successful email strategy, and they noticed that batchers, these are people that actually do batch their email responses or our messaging, uh, as opposed to real-time processing, actually reported not only increases in productivity, but also lower cortisol. This is huge, give it a try. This is new research, hot off the press. So try email, uh, at least batch processing your email and it should make a massive difference for you. Now, I know we're almost up on time, so I wanted to wrap up with a summary here. I said a lot, I know. Thank you for bearing with me as I even stumbled over my words with talking so fast. But some of the key takeaways here is, number one, set your MITs at the start of the day. Do not be a passenger. Drive your day. Drive your career. That is what today is all about. Drive your career. What is the most impactful thing that you can do for your own personal productivity today, your team's productivity today? Let that be the driver and let that be the anchor for your day and your day's productivity. Two, clean up your digital hygiene. I assure you, if you can see your phone, it's going to be draining your cognitive resources. If you still have notifications on, it's going to be drowning and draining your cognitive resources. Clean up your digital hygiene and don't forget grayscale. Give it a try. Three is focus sprints. It's a methodology of work. It doesn't have to be an hour. It can be 30 minutes. It can be 45 minutes. It can be 15 minutes. It can be two hours. Do focus sprints. It's a way of working. I'll send up some follow-up resources for everyone. Let me know if you have questions about this. Now I'll end on this note. Use this opportunity, everyone, for really experimenting with the way in which you work. This is a phenomenal opportunity to get experimental. Tell folks, tell your boss that, listen, I listened to one of our wacky neuroscientists from Cal, and she mentioned all of these different uh, strategies, and I'd like to try one of them if it's okay. I'm going to check I'm going to check email every two hours. And if something, an, a really red fire emergency happens, I can't wait till the end of the hour, or the end of two hours. Here's, here's my cell. I assure you, most people will not use it, but use this opportunity to get experimental and try some things out. And if you really loved these kinds of insights and want to stay up to date on research that we're doing at Cal on productivity, you can use this bit.ly link here um, or um, send me an email to my personal email and you can use the code GoBears uh, to sign up. And it's um, bit.ly slash uh, WFH, work from home, <laughs> slash superhuman. And the code is go bears. And on that note, I'm actually going to stop sharing screen and just say thank you, um, Angela, Maddie, everyone, uh, for letting me join you all today and, and feel like I can be a part of this amazing um, conference today. And, and thank you all for your time. Thank you so much, Sahar. You are awesome, my friend. I knew you were going to just do a great job and bring people to the close of this conference in such an inspiring and helpful and thoughtful way. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. And, and the team really appreciates you being with us for the afternoon keynote for the NOW conference. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. And so with that, uh, we bring the close to the 2020 Next Opportunity at Work conference, Envision Your Future. On behalf of Berkeley People and Culture and the People and Organization Development team, thank you so much for spending today with us. I hope you had a wonderful day of discovery and enlightenment and that you're leaving inspired as you envision your future. Please remember this isn't a one and done experience for us. Visit us at grow.berkeley.edu anytime to learn about all of the growth and development opportunities that we have for you as staff at Berkeley throughout the year. In the next month or so, we're gonna be uploading all of today's great content to the NOW website. So you'll be able to revisit anything you saw and experience the concurrent sessions that you missed and share all of today's great learning with your colleagues. On one final note, please remember to fill out your program evaluation so that we can continue to learn and grow and make next year's conference even better. 
And as a special thank you, everyone who returns a completed evaluation will be entered into our grand prize raffle drawing. Thank you, thank you for everybody. Thank you to the planning committee, our presenters, our coaches, our recruiters, our activity break leaders. Thank you to our sponsor at Under Armour. And thank you all for being with us today to make today possible. We really appreciate you. We thank you for all the work that you do. And we're here to help you grow at your time at Berkeley. So thanks for being with us today. And we hope to see you in, in any of our other developmental programs as we progress through, through the days and the years and in your time here with us here at Berkeley. Thank you.